呃，今天星期六啊，明天没有课。Today is Saturday. We don't have class tomorrow. 嗯，下个星期的课程呢也是一样的。And then the schedule for next week is the same as this week, which is the wish fulfilling treasury for the first three days, and then Shrangama Sutra beginning from Thursday through Saturday. In terms of the grades for the first half of the year, is now already. Available is already graded and available, and then the those of you who have received really good marks, you will be able to receive awards. Usually, we do that those kinds of ceremonies and end of term at the end of the year, but now we. We'll have those at the mid of the year, which is right after the Kshetri Garba Dharma Assembly, the offering, the cloud-like offering. In general, I think the management of various departments of education curriculum and of financial departments and so on and so forth are working very hard. Different departments have their supervising Dharma teachers. So for the supervising Dharma teachers, I know that you work really hard, and I would suggest that you should look into the financial aspects of the departments as well, because if you do not manage those aspects of each department's various kinds of uh, um, difficulties and um, uh, obstacles may happen. For example, one should not willingly to use the money from the department to lend the money from departments to others, or to use even one cent of the money of uh, the sangha, because any wealth that belongs to the sangha should not be used lightly. If the supervising dharma teachers do not know what is happening on the books, then it is not going to be very helpful. This is in terms of the financial aspects, and then the second aspect is about discipline. We have concluded our dharma, a collective dharma practice of Vajrasattva, and there are people, for example, who do not really belong here, who travel. From elsewhere to Larangar, and if they are not enrolled in classes, if they are not enrolled in any of the sectors, then we should know who they are. The different Dharma teachers of the different classes need to know who your disciples are, and need to know.、Uh, we need to know who. Is not involved in the study and、uh, the educational system of Larongar. If someone, for example, living here but using excuses of their health or、uh, other excuses to stay here but not enrolled in classes, then the study and education departments need to know their situations and need to know what is going on. Initially, as a Buddhist. Sangha, we do not wish to expel anyone or to force anyone to go. But、uh, if a person who is not enrolled in any of the classes yet is staying here without、uh, listening to our suggestions, then we would have to take different、uh, measures to take care of that situation. Yesterday, I think I. Yesterday, I went to the award ceremony of、uh, the Jumos, the Tibetan Jumos. A few of the authorities came to Larangar, and then I, myself as well as Kemal Sutra Mojo, had to leave that award ceremony early to have a meeting with those authorities. And then I heard after we left. 
the Tibetan Jumo started to dance around and to walk around uh, in the middle of uh, that uh, award ceremony. So we can see that if indeed there are people who are not mentally well to uh, stay here or suitable to stay here. This is a Buddhist university compared to the students uh, to the uh, worldly universities. Is it that uh, we should accept everyone? And uh, is it that uh, uh, anyone could simply just stay here and uh, not leave at all? So we need to contemplate upon that. We welcome the true practitioners, the genuine practitioners, and the people who genuinely wish to study and contemplate. But uh, there are various situations associated to various people who are not uh, suited to stay here. And we need to have regulations and rules about what to do when such people do not wish to depart from Mangar. When the Buddha was still alive and he made those rules for his Sangha, why is that? Why is it that uh, there are so many rules, disciplines associated to the Sangha, to the bhikshus, the bhikshunis, and why there are some of the things that are allowed or permitted by the Buddha and the things that's not permitted at all by the Buddha? We need to contemplate on such reasons. If we were to have too many people, then the rules may be broken and uh, everything could uh, become quite chaotic. This is the first thing. And the second thing is that my entering into the Shuan Hall and uh, uh, getting out of the Shuan Hall, in the past, I never had any, uh, any guards or people who would guard me and uh, escort me out of the Shuan Hall. Now there are some people who wish and who voluntarily stand up and uh, uh, escort me out, but I am a bit concerned still because it seems that only the female practitioners would stand up and uh, escort me out and escort me in, which doesn't look very dignified. We have uh, the, we have some of the staff members uh, at uh, Larungar, and most of them are female members, uh, female staff members. They're people who purposely would take take photos of uh, me standing among so many female members and posted online, it doesn't look very dignified at all. So the management team or the uh, couples and the male members can then maybe clear the entrance or the uh, exit when there are crowds of people. I think whenever there's a male lama, uh, entering or exiting the shrine hall, it will be the best for the male members to be there to escort the lama. That being said, I hope that you can know what uh, can be done and what uh, shouldn't be done. For example, back in 1995, there was uh, a great lama who also came to uh, Larungar, and then that master is still alive today, and he's the uh, guard at the time. Only cared for the Lama, but not for the uh, audience over there. And, he, and uh, that guard asked uh, people to get out of the way. And now people started calling him the Toku of uh, getting, the getting out of the way Toku. I'm sure people here are so learned if uh, you're treated with such arrogance and force. 
then you probably won't appreciate that kind of action. That is why I need to remind you, please pay attention to your actions and please uh, be more skillful when it comes to dealing with the others, especially nowadays. I understand that there are so many people here and then the people have lots of uh, different ideas and uh, if there are people around, if there are people who are out of their mind and just uh, stab you, and what would you do? So you need to be cautious. Many people had warned me that. And I, so I replied, if I were to be attacked in such a way, then I would have fallen on the ground. And what else can I do? Well, it may or may not happen, but uh, it did happen once uh, uh, Toku Akon, who was living at his residence, who was staying at his residence in Chengdu, and then he was stabbed by some, uh, by some people who just uh, ran into his uh, residence, though he also had uh, three or four people who uh, was around him to protect him, but uh, they also uh, they also fall into the pool of blood as well. Back in the middle school, I was very good at fighting, but I have not fought for many years, and I don't think I've uh, uh, harbored any grudge with anyone for the past many uh, decades. However, nowadays uh, there are people who would uh, generate a sense of jealousy, but whomsoever or however these kinds of things are, I think it's necessary for me to now have some people, some male members uh, around me to maybe clear the way a bit when I enter or exit uh, the shrine hall. People who are a little bit uh, smart and to know what to do around people. There's a couple uh, who usually walks with me and then he would hold this object in his hand and I asked him what he's uh, holding that object for. He said that just in case if people wish to get blessings. The other day, a large group of uh, lamas uh, uh, was standing right in front of uh, the Grand Shrine Hall and then asked the Kempo with that object in his hand uh, not to stand too close to me I, because I feel a little bashful and then um, at first First, all those lamas who were looking at me, and then they uh, were then directed their attention to the kempo who was holding that object, long object in his hand, and uh, as if he was holding a sword like Mandushri. So I told him, well, it's better for you to keep that in your bag and not to just hold it uh, around me like this. And he said, okay, so, it, so, so I will do that. I didn't wrong you, isn't it? Bakar Targam Sando Sharma, Dotum Batuji Chanla, Kisham Sara, Nature was telling his young son, Jawar Tiji Shanla Yella. Jimmy Pensos Alan Sora and the Gonjit Tobampo, Rashinji Lo. The answer passed profound and a wonderful dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of aeons. I now see it here, receive and uphold it. I vow to fathom the Tara's true meaning to liberate all sentient beings, thus generate the supreme bodhicitta. Now let us begin the Shrangama Sutra again. Shrangama Sutra. Let us begin the class on the Shrangama Sutra. The Shrangama Sutra is a teaching that is in between the second turning and the third turning of the Dharma wheel. With the leaning to the second turning, Usually, in the first turning of the Dharma wheel, the Buddha gives the teachings on the five aggregates, six entrances, the twelve ayartanas, and eighteen datus, and the Buddha talks about how uh, talked about the existence of them, especially in the teachings such as Abhidharma. Um, there is no description of the nature of them being empty. But in the Shrangama Sutra, over here, the Buddha talks about the nature of them being false. 
Though there is the appearance of them, but there is no solid existence of them. In the previous classes, we've already talked about the ten ayatanas out of the twelve. We talked about the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and the body, as well as the perceiving objects. In pairs, we've already finished talking about the 10 out of the 12. Today, we will cover the last pair, which is the Dharma, or the mind, mind and Dharma. Compared to the previous 10, this one is a little bit difficult, a little bit. By now, we know that the eyes, nose, ears, um, tongue, and the body is called the faculty that has formed. And the, ob the perceiving objects are also associated to each of them. Also, each of those objects, the perceiving objects, all are considered as the ones with form as well, according to the Sabativada school. Now, in terms of dharma, the subject that perceives the dharma is the mind. As we've talked about that before, the mind, the mind, the faculty of mind, perceives the object that is dharma, all kinds of dharmas. So in terms of the um, dust, the dharma dust, there is no solid existence of it, unlike the form, sound, touch, and uh, smell and taste. So it is perceived through the mind in a way that is just like uh, an image. And the image has all kinds of leanings, such as good and bad. Therefore, we call this as the Dharma dust. Now let's look at the, la the last two, the last pair. The Buddha says, Ananda, your mind is always conditioned by the three qualities, good, bad, and, in and uh, uh, indeterminate which produce patterns of dharmas. In your mind, in your mind faculty, in your consciousness, there are the conditions that has the three qualities, the good, the bad, and the, the indeterminated. With those three conditions, there would be the production of patterns of dharma. Sometimes you can call it as the defiling object, the dust, the dharmas. And then there are the three types, the good, the bad, and the indeterminate. The dharma over here doesn't mean the Buddha dharma. It is rather pointing to the defiling objects, the dust. Just as how to our eye faculty, there is the form, the defiling objects uh, that can be perceived by the eye faculty. The good and the bad and the indeterminate can also exist in such a way. So it is called the three types of defiling objects, defiling dharma objects, or the dharma dust. That's a direct translation from the Chinese translation. Earlier I was looking for the entering the gate, the gateway to knowledge. And I was looking for the explanation of the defiling objects of the dharmas. What what is the explanation of that? Do you remember it? I think it would be 
good for the Kempos and Kemos to sit a little bit closer. I didn't say that the Kempos and Kemos shouldn't come to listen to the class in the Shuan Hall. Now that we don't have any Kempos and Kemos sitting at the front, other than our chant leader, everyone else is sitting at the back, or maybe they're not even here, because they don't want to sit at the back of the shrine hall. Maybe they're too used to sitting on the Dharma throne and doesn't want to sit at the back anymore. I've taught Abhidharma for 20 years. I, I've I taught on the Dhar on the Abhidharma twenty years ago, and I only studied for one or two times. So it wasn't my it isn't my specialty, unlike Madhyamika or Ati, which is definitely more familiar to me. So over here, what is the defiling objects of Dharma? <laughs> What's the explanation in Abhidharma? Now all of our senior practitioners can remember those. Ah, Nobody study is nobody that is currently studying Abhidharma is sitting around here today? Well, we would have to further investigate it later. The condition and unconditioned. According to what you're saying, then the color of the pillar would also belong to the unconditioned, and the sound is also unconditioned. All right, you have to look into it later. Um, let's continue with the sutra. Are these dharmas produced by the mind, or do they have a special place apart from the mind? The Buddha started asking, are these dharmas produced by the mind, or do they have any special places apart from the mind, or are there other locations? All of these defiling objects, where is it produced? Is it produced from the mind or by the mind, or is it 
that they locate at a very special place apart from the mind. Ananda, if you were, if they were the mind, if all the good and bad and uh, indeterminate, the dharmas would not be its defiling objects. The Buddha over here says that, Ananda, if you were to say that this is your mind, all the good, bad, and indeterminate are products of your mind, then all the dharma are definitely not defiling objects anymore because they are the production of mind. Whatever defiling objects you're talking about, they're no longer defiling objects anymore. In this way, the defiling objects, since it's not an object, since they would not be conditions of the mind, how could you say that they had a location? When we say that the sound is the condition for the ears and the dharma as the condition for the mind. But if you were to say that the mind actually produces the defiling object that is the dharma, then it is no longer the object. It is no longer the condition of the mind anymore. The dharma as the object is definitely there. But if you were to say that a mind produced dharma, then that is wrong, because then uh, the dharma wouldn't be the object, uh, wouldn't be the, the object that to be perceived. Suppose they were to have a special place apart from the mind, then would the dharma themselves be able to know? Now here's the question. If you were to say that the dharma is somewhere else, it is outside of the mind, it is at another location, then you are to say that there is an entity, there is an existent characteristic to the dharma, then let me ask you, does this uh, self-character the dharma has the sense of knowing or not? Because if you were to say that there is the defiling object that is dharma that is existent, let me ask you, does it have the sense of knowing or not? If they were to have a sense of knowing, they would be called a mind. If they were something other than you, they would be something else, someone else's mind, since they're not a defiling object. Well, if you were to say that, yes, it does have a sense of knowing, if it has a sense of knowing, it is mind, it is consciousness. You are saying that there is an existent dharma that is on the outside, and it is not defiling object, and it, is, it has the sense of knowing, and it is different than your knowing, but it is also your object. In this way, you are to say that other than your mind consciousness, there is, there is something that is not, uh, uh, not defiling object. And that is equivalent to say that there is someone else's mind stream on the outside. If they were the same as you, they would be your own mind. But how could your own mind stand apart from you? Since you've already said that your object is a is located at a different place and it's a different type of existence and it has its own sense of knowing and it has consciousness which is equivalent to say that it is the mind stream of someone else or some other mind stream. So your mind is your mind. It cannot be transformed to other people's mind. This way, how could you say that the other, there is another mind stream that's outside of you that is another mind stream? 
好，三法也好，或者说是这个恶法也好，无记法也好，那这个呢就是发称的。但是我刚开始，刚开始呢，这个 subject and then the object, whatever they are, the good or the bad or the indeterminate, those are the defiled object. If you were to say that this dharma, this defiled object, has a different location to exist and it has a sense of knowing, so your mind is one. Mind, your object, the object of your mind, which is the defiling object of dharma, becomes another mind. In this way, it still has something connected to you, but your the connection between you and the defiling objects. Becomes two different minds. That is absurd. It is to say that when I visualize with my mind of the Buddha statue, so the mind that I visualize is one mind, and then the Buddha statue that I visualize becomes another mind, which becomes the two different minds. That is definitely wrong. So that's the first question that's being addressed. Being addressed. Now let's look at the second one. Suppose that they were to have no sense of knowing. The first question is to say that it does the defiling object that is the dharma that has a sense of knowing. Now the second one is suppose they were to have no sense of knowing. Yet these defiling objects are not form, sound, smells, or tastes. They are neither cold nor warm, nor the characteristic of emptiness. Where would they be located? This is to say that the defiling objects to your mind, the the defiling objects to your mind is definitely not form, not sound, not hearing, not smelling, not taste, and not touching. It is not cold and not warmth. Not they are neither connected nor apart. Because over here the cold nor warmth and together and apart means it's part of the sensation. Touch. Nor the characteristic of emptiness. Without the sense of knowing, then it would be considered as the objects of the form, sound, smell, taste, and touch and emptiness. Other than that, there are no other. There, is, there are no other dharmas around. That's existence. In this way, can you still locate your defiling object that is the dharma? Where is the object of the dharma? Of the dharma. Then, in the second sentence, we have established that they are represented in neither form nor emptiness, nor is likely that they exist somewhere. In the human realm, beyond emptiness, all the way between form to emptiness, there is no way to find it. You won't be able to. You won't be able to locate it. You won't be able to describe it by saying that it is in the shape of a square, of a circle, or it's. Beautiful. 
or emptiness. There is nothing that would be um, categorized as the third type other than form or emptiness. All the way between the form to emptiness, there is nothing that can be found that is called the dharma. Now let me ask you, can you point to something that is neither form nor emptiness? There is something that is called the dharmas. Can you point to it? There is no way that you would be able to do so. Indeed, it is, as we said before, we are not able to find it through the seeing, and uh, we're not able to obtain the hearing, uh, nor the smelling, nor the taste, or the touch. There is no way to obtain it. Therefore, the dharmas also, it is not attainable through our mind, through the consciousness, there is no way to obtain it. It's quite easy, isn't it, to come to the conclusion of everything's empty. I remember that uh, Veruchana composed a commentary on the Heart Sutra, very brief but concise. Over here, we are also talking about that there is no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body. This is quite easy to understand that they are simply empty. In the conventional sense, however, they do manifest. But the absolute, in the absolute sense, there is nothing that is obtained. There is nothing that is truly existent. So the Buddha said that the mind could not be aware of them. Whence then would they arise? If you were to say that it is not the object, not the condition for the mind to preserve, to perceive, whence then would they arise? Other than mind, there is no dharmas. And then the Buddha made a short conclusion saying that therefore you should know that neither Dharma nor the mind has a location. There is no place for neither of them. There is no place for the um, there is no location for the mind for the consciousness. We've already talked about that. Nor is there a location for the dharmas. And so the places of mind and dharmas are empty and false. Their origin is not in causes and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. It is not to say that they're not existent in conventional truth. In fact, in conventional truth, there is the manifestation. But in the absolute truth, there is no true existence to them. According to the Diamond Sutra, it is says that if the mind has a place to abide, it is not abiding. If the mind has a place to abide, in fact, it is not abiding. The existence and not existence, the abiding and not abiding, they are exactly the same. It sounds contradicting, isn't it? But it is not. According to Mipa Rinpoche, speaking of certainty, it says that the manifestation and emptiness is not, is not different. They appear to be contradictive, but they are not. So over here it says that their origin is not in causes and conditions nor do their natures arise spontaneously. It is simply the wondrous manifestation of the Buddha nature. Before we make the observation, they manifest it so vividly. But after detailed our observation, we would be able to understand they're simply empty. With the direct pointing out 
from the Guru during your empowerments or uh, during the direct pointing out instructions. The teacher, the Guru, would give you instructions on such as whatever thoughts you have right now, let it be vicious, let it be good. They are simply just like white and black clouds. If you look at the nature of it right now, right at that moment, in fact, all the good and bad would simply disappear in the nature uh, of in its nature. Just like how clouds would dis disperse in the emptiness in the space. On one hand, yes, all of those um, illusions of the form, sound, and taste, and smell, and touch, um, they manifest with great vicissitude. Yesterday, uh, someone said that he eats four kilos of ghee in about over one month. And I calculated a bit at home today, and I thought, wow, that's a lot to eat. This person probably takes too much of uh, uh, oil every day. Um, if one were to finish the four kilos of ghee within 45 days, that means he's going to eat one. 100 grams of ghee every day, that is way too much. Because if you were to eat 25 grams, that is more of a reasonable uh, intake of ghee. If you eat too much, that, that is going to burden your body. He's not here today. Maybe he ate too much ghee. <coughs> Since he's not here, then uh, I'm going to move on. How could he finish eating <laughs> four kilos of ghee in 45 days? Anyways, let's not talk about ghee. I will not talk about that again. Let's now look at the 18 datus, the 18 realms. Moreover, Ananda, why do I say that the 18 realms are basically the wonderful nature of the true suchness, the treasury of the thus come one? Again, the wonderful nature of the true suchness, the Buddha nature, Datus or the realms, the six roots, six objects, six consciousness are called the realms, datus. Datu, according to Abhidharma, it has the connotation of seed. That is from the Sanskrit point of view. And some of the great masters from China mainland had explained that the Datu also has the connotation of realms. For example, uh, we would talk about the desire realm. Because all the sentient beings that share the same quality would be in the same realm, or the form realm and formless realm. So that too also has that particular connotation as well. In the Uttar Tantra Shastra, there are different, different explanations on datus as well. For example, when there's the explanation of datus, uh, there's the explanation on the datu of the rocks, the datu of the gold, of the silver, which also means the specific characteristics to them, the specific qualities to them. So each of the sentient beings, so all the sentient beings share Buddha nature, and that is the type of datu as well. So over here it says that there are 18 datus, out of which mainly in the Shrangama Sutra we are going to refute the six consciousness. Because if we can refute the true existence of the six consciousness, then it is very easy to refute the faculty and the objects. 
Because if you were to break the wall in the center, the uh, weight-bearing wall in the center, then it's easy to uh, break the other two walls to support it. So the Buddha over here mainly refuted the six consciousness because after refuting the six consciousness, uh, the eye consciousness, mind consciousness, and so on, then the um, object and the root will be easily uh, refuted. Ananda, uh, the Buddha over here says, as you understand it, the eyes and form created the conditions that produce the eye consciousness. <coughs> the Buddha said that Ananda, as you understand it, so since you already understand the principle, the eyes and form created by the conditions that produce the eye consciousness with the condition of the faculty, that is the eye, and then the object, which is the form, with these two causes and conditions, then there is the eye consciousness. Ananda also recognized that as correct. And then the Buddha continued to ask him, is the consciousness produced because of the eye such that the eyes are its realm? Or is it produced because of form such that the form is its realm? The eye consciousness definitely has to rely on the eye faculty so that it will become the eye datu. It is just like whenever we look at those mixed race babies, if uh, the father is from the West and then uh, the mother is from the East, and then with the uh, mix of the two different race, the baby would carry both of them. So um, the Buddha said that is your eye consciousness. Produced because of the eye, such that the eyes are its realm, or is it because of the form, such that the form is the realm? At this point, Ananda is still not talking. Since Ananda is not talking, then the Buddha continued to say that Ananda, if it were produced because of the eyes, then in the absence of emptiness and form, it would not be able to make distinctions. If you were to think that the eye consciousness rely on the eye faculty, if it is produced from the eye faculty, eye consciousness is a type of consciousness. If it were, if it was a, a product simply by relying on eye faculty, then there is no form. It is simply empty. Then there is no form and no emptiness. Then there is no distinctions anymore. There is no colors and there is no forms that can be seen, the mountains and the, the green leaves and the flowers and whatever things. You would not be able to distinguish any of them because those are the distinctions can be made by the eye faculty, but on the eye faculty, there are no forms and colors and emptiness on it. Therefore, if it was simply just rely on the eye faculty, then your whole world would just be a blur. There is no way for you to distinguish it. And the Buddha continued to say that, and so, even if you had consciousness, what use would it be? Though you have eye consciousness, though this consciousness that you say is reliant on your faculty, but what's the function of it? What's the use of it? It is completely useless. Moreover, your seeing is neither green, yellow, red, nor white. There is virtually nothing in which it is, pr uh, it is presented. Therefore, what is the realm established from? If your consciousness is based on your eye faculty, then you should not be able to see any of those colors or any shapes of square, triangle, uh, nor of up and down, none of those. 
Because on your eye faculty, there is no color, there is no blue, red, and uh, uh, white, and so on. How could you establish the realm? What is the realm established from? All the varieties and the colorful manifestations of this world is simply non-existent for you if it is completely built up on your eye faculty. Therefore, the eye consciousness cannot be a, pro a, a product from the eye faculty. Now, the second possibility Suppose it were produced because of form. In emptiness, then there was no form. Your consciousness would be extinguished. Then why is it that the consciousness know the nature of emptiness? If you were to say that eye consciousness is a product from form, then we look at the space, which is completely empty. There is no form, there is no color. At that moment, your consciousness should be extinct. There should be no consciousness at all, because you are saying that your eye consciousness is simply reliant on the form. By the same logic, you will be able to, um, you will be able to understand that when you see emptiness, there is no way for you to see form. Then everything would be empty. Then how would you know that there is something that is called emptiness? Um, or vice versa, if you see a form, then you won't know there is something that is called emptiness. If you see emptiness, there is no way that you can see other forms. Previously, we also discussed the nature of space or nature of emptiness. Uh, it is that there is nothing that's right in front of you that is called the sea emptiness or seeing space. Uh, it is uh, similar to say that there, if there is a lack of light, then it is seeing darkness. Suppose a form changes, you're also conscious of the changing appearances, but your eye consciousness does not change. Where is the boundary established? If you were to say that there is a form changes, Previously, we talked about um, if the eye consciousness is reliant on the production of the form, if the production of the eye consciousness is based on the form, then at the time of the production of the form, one will have the um, fault of not seeing emptiness. But now you said that you already see form, and then later you see emptiness the form has already changed. The form, since the form has already changed, there are two explanations. One is that the form, whatever colors and shapes, that changes. Your consciousness, uh, your grasping towards holding on this form would also change, but your consciousness cannot change. Why not? It is because your eye consciousness is derived from form. So if the form has already changed and your eye consciousness is produced. In this way, your consciousness cannot change. So how could you um, establish the boundary of your the change of your eye datu of your eye consciousness? If you cannot establish it, then you would have to understand that it is faulty. If the eye consciousness were to change when form changed, then there would be no appearance of a realm. Previously, you said that the eye consciousness comes from the form. Then when form changes, the consciousness 
Why is it not? Because you have changed the colors and shapes along with the form. Then there is no idea to anymore. Why is that? It is because the form is changed. Then there is no idea to anymore. Why is that? It is because there is no existent characteristic of the idea to anymore. Because as long as there is a change, there is no existent character to it. Your consciousness should not change with the object if it is an independently existent entity. If it were not to change, it would be constant, and given that it was produced from form, it should have no conscious knowledge of where there was emptiness. Now, if you were to say that the eye consciousness is not changing, and it is produced from form, in this way, your eye consciousness should not know the existence of emptiness because it is not changing. Your eye consciousness, though being produced from a form, it should not it should not know that there is space, and space is contradictory to form. So we know that it is not. Uh, reasonable to say that it is a per, uh, the eye consciousness is a production from uh, the eye faculty or from the form. Suppose the eye consciousness arose from both, from the eyes and from, and from form. This is very similar to most of people's consideration nowadays. People would say that by the uh, collaboration with the focal condition and the dominating condition, then there is the production of the eye consciousness. But that is not correct either. Why is that? If they were united, there would still be a point of separation. If they were separate, there would still be a point of contact. Hence, the substance and nature would be chaotic and disorderly. How could a realm be set up in such a way? Over here, the Buddha said that if one were to say that it needs the two conditions, um, the eye faculty and the forms all together, and then there is the production of the eye consciousness. But this commonly um, this common consideration that we share nowadays is incorrect as well because there are the, there are the faults that's associated to it. What are the faults? That is, if they were united, there would still be a point of separation. If they were separate, there would still be a point of contact. What does that mean? It means that. My eye faculty and the object, which is the form, gives the production of eye consciousness. Then are they separate or are they united? Now, if they were united on this side, for example, there is this is the part of the eye faculty that is the faculty's part. On my other fist, that is my. That is the form part. That is the object. In this way, the eye faculty becomes the two things. One that has something to do with faculty, and the other part has something to do with object. In this way, once they are connected, the faculty part also include the form part, uh, the object part. So in between the two, there is still a separation between 
between them. According to Master Changshui and Master Ouyi, they talked about how the root also, the faculty also ha, has the part that has uh, the consciousness, has knowing, but the but the object it doesn't, the defiling object doesn't have knowing. So one has knowing, and the other one doesn't have knowing. That is not appropriate. That's their explanation. But according to the Hinayana tradition a, a point of view, in fact, the faculty also is considered as inanimate either. It doesn't have the capacity of knowing, same as the defiling object. Faculty, according to Abhidhamma, it says that the faculty is also an inanimate form. So if it is connected, if it is united, then there is still a separation in between. If it is separated, then when the two connect, the, the uh, characteristic would be disordered and it would be chaotic. The substance and the nature would be chaotic and uh, disordered. Why is that so? It is because the defiling objects, datu, the other one is the datu of the uh, faculty. And then we also have another factor that is eye consciousness. So does, it, does this eye consciousness uptake the datu, the realm of the object or the realm of the faculty, or mixing the two together, which is disorderly and chaotic? So that is not appropriate either. You should understand it in such a way. Therefore, you should know that as to the eyes and form being the conditions that produce the realm of eye consciousness, none of the three places exists. These three places is not existent. So the logic goes to first refute the eye consciousness, and through that you would be able to understand that there is no solid existence of the the eye faculty, nor of the form. Thus, the eye's form and the form realm, these three do not have their origin in causes and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. They're simply just like the children of the barren woman or the hare to the tortoise and horns to the rabbit. The three. The three, the eyes form and the eyes form and eye consciousness is it form realm or is it eye consciousness what does it refer to I didn't notice the I didn't pay close attention to the Tibetan translation earlier is it the three places, the three realms? Over here, it doesn't really talk about eye consciousness because over here, mainly it talks about the three realms. So uh, here is a form realm. Let's stop here today. <coughs>